Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for our webinar on quality checks for powder professionals. This webinar is one of a series of webinars we've put together designed to help train professional powder coaters on many different aspects of the powder coating business. As always, we know we have customers with a wide range of experience and interest, and we appreciate we can't capture everything in one short webinar, but we'll try to run through some of the easy and simple quality control checks that can be done by any powder coder. So this pre uh, presentation is going to be run by Jason Parton, one of our experienced technical application engineers, and he's got many years of experience. And you'll also see David Merritt, who's another IFS technical application expert. You'll see him via video, and he's going to show how to perform some of the tests. So uh, you can find the videos we show, as well as many others, in the res resource section of the IFS website, and you'll also find them on YouTube. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Jason. All right, thanks Fiona. I think today we'll start talking about film thickness first. Uh, film thickness is very important. Uh, not only does it affect the looks of the coating, uh, film thickness will also affect the, the, the performance of a coating. So we always want to make sure uh, that we are in the, the film build range. So there's several you know, different types of film thickness gauges. There are some mechanical film thickness gauges that uh, use kind of a magnet. And as you touch the part and pull away, it knows so much pull is basically two mils or three mils. Those are not real uh, reliable and real exact, uh, but they will get you in a range like a two to three mil range or a four to five mil range probably. Uh, but, you know, most of the gauges that people are using are, are an electronic type gauge that uh, you simply place the, the area of measurement onto the substrate, hold it for a second or two, and the gauge will give you a reading. Uh, obviously, with any type of gauges, I want to say this up front, you do need to calibrate these gauges. You do need to make sure they measure a known thickness properly. Uh, or you could be lying to yourself about what your true film thickness is. Uh, a couple things to think about. Obviously, we have multiple diff different types of substrate. Uh, so if you're doing steel, uh, iron type metals, you need a gauge that will read that. That gauge might or might not read aluminum as well. Uh, so we do paint a lot of aluminum. That is a different uh, iron free substrate, so you, it has to be able to measure both. So if you're looking at gauges, they make some cheaper gauges that are a couple of hundred dollars that might very well do what you need it to do. Uh, and then they make gauges that are 1500, 2000, you know, uh, on up their gauges uh, that are much more precise, much more uh, uh, capable. Uh, of giving multiple readings and averages and things of that. So it really depends on what you need as to what you should buy. Just make sure you get the substrate covered uh, and, a, and a reliable gauge uh, that that is is going to last. Uh, you know, we talked about why is the film thickness so important? Obviously, the visual look. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is if if we make a powder that uh, can handle a thousand hour salt spray at two mils, that does not mean it can handle a thousand hours of salt spray at one mil. So uh, we mentioned this in several of our webinars. We make a TDS sheet for each product and, and we give you a range of what film build should be as that is where that product will perform the best. So with that said, we have uh, our, our next slide is going to be a video of uh, that Dave Merritt, our, our other application engineer manager, has made, and he's going to briefly discuss how to uh, how to properly measure the film with a film build gauge. Hello, I am David. I'm the technical service manager at IFS Coatings, and today we're going to look at quality control checks on cured panels we've already prepared. Doing this, we want to make sure that the powder will perform to the technical data sheet 
and the information that uh, you will see on our data sheets. The panel that we're going to be doing today is the Safety Yellow. The film thickness, recommended film thickness for this particular product is two to three mils. Using a film thickness gauge, I always like to make sure that the unit is calibrated. So with these little shims, we will check. I've already zeroed the instrument. And we have 9.1, which is in the standard deviation for this piece of equipment. And same here. Now, as I said, we like to be within a 2 to 3 mil window for a recommended film thickness. And this one's 2.2 at the top and 2.0 at the bottom. With that, this panel is within the recommended film thickness that IFS requires for this product. So we are good to go as far as the application is compared. The gauge that I'm using today is my own personal. And it reads both aluminum and steel. You want to be sure if you are buying a gauge and you are using both types of metal that you have one that will read both. Now, this particular gauge is in the $100 range. They can be in mid-range. They could go from $400 to $800, depending on the bells and whistles that you wish to get on these particular units. So I recommend you do a little research before you buy these and make sure that the mill or the gauge will read to your specification. Hopefully that uh, clears up you know, how a film bill gauge should be used. Next, I would like to talk about solvent rubs. So the, the main purpose of checking uh, uh, coating with solvent rubs is to, to see if that coating is truly cured or not. Uh, the only other way to check cure is to physically send a part and have a, a, a analysis ran on it. And obviously we all don't have time to do that. And, uh, so this is a good hands-on, easy, easy test that uh, doesn't take a lot of uh, ability or equipment or anything like that to perform the test. So the the two common types of solvent that we use in this, uh, a lot of people use acetone, and a lot of people use MEK methyl ethyl ketone. Uh, in your ASTM standards, uh, you'll usually see it noted as MEK. Uh, but uh, acetone is a common test as well. So uh, performing a test, uh, I guess a couple of things I've learned over, over the years, you can perform this test when the part is hot. Uh, you will see that normally you will not get as good results until the part has cooled down. As a matter of fact, in most uh, corrosion retesting or true uh, standard testing, most people will not uh, test under a 24 hour period. They'll at least wait 24 hours before they would perform a, perform a test for like a, a major OEM supplier. So, uh, but generally, if it will pass when it's hot, it will even perform better when the part is cooled down. So what's a fail? And this is, uh, this is kind of an opinion. Uh, it's also, years of experience uh, knowing what products uh, will will pass and won't pass and, and what some of the failures are. So normally what we would call a failure is when you take a Q-tip, submit, submerge it into acetone or MEK, get it good and wet, and then press it against the surface, move it forward and back about an inch, whatever, two inches, whatever you want to do, that is considered a double rub. Most products are going to be 25 double rubs. If you're talking about epoxies, it could be 50 or even 100 double rubs. Epoxies are great when it comes to solvent resistance. So you would press firmly, 25 double rubs at the head of that Q-tip. Look at the Q-tip, look at the coating, and there's a couple of things we want to look for. First of all, did the coating soften or degloss? It's very common to see a little bit of gloss go away on the coating, even though it's cured. 
many times if that is the case and you heat it back up, the gloss will come back. It is also common to see a little bit of color transfer on the Q-tip, not a significant amount, but just a hint of color. So if you're if you've got a white Q-tip and you're doing a a red part, uh, you know, just to see that kind of pinking up a little bit, uh, maybe just a little bit of red, uh, I would not call that a fail. However, if you continue to rub and you feel that coating getting soft and almost uh, e even, you know, gooey, or, you know, you can tell that it's really dragging that Q-tip, then that most definitely is a fail. And if it rubs all the way through to substrate, then then you are, are really under cured. So there's a fine line across those products that if I'm doing an epoxy, I would expect to hardly get any transfer and really any deglossing if that product is cured. Uh, other chemistries, certain colors like high pigment colors, yellows, reds, uh, things of that nature, tin tend to not uh, perform as well in, in, a, in this test. So you will see some transfer. You will see some deglossing of the, part of, the, of the coating. To me, that is not a failure. Uh, if the coating softens and continues to fail as you continue to rub, then I would consider that a failure. So with that said, uh, if you are ever questioning whether something is a fail or a pass, you know, the, the only way to confirm that is to send it to your supplier, have them run a true cure test on it, uh, and they can tell you. And a lot of times over the years, we build history that says, we know this white is going to, you know, degloss a little bit. It's okay if it does that. But we know that because we've sent it in, done the actual test, and compared the two together, and we really know where we stand. So, don't ever be afraid to discuss it with your tech service rep or your manufacturer, what their expectations are on a on a solvent test. And and again, over time, you will realize that certain chemistry, certain colors act just a little bit different. We are going to do another installment of a QC test normally done as a field test for cure. And this is a MEK test that we're going to be using that sometimes we also do in our QA laboratories. The solvents that we're going to be using are going to be MEK. And there are also other applications where acetone and possibly xylene can also be used. Uh, there is a ASTM method for this type of testing. The products that we'll be using basically with the solvent is a Q-tip and we will soak the Q-tip with the MEK and do 25 double rubs. In this test you may see a slight rub off but that's okay. The main thing we want to make sure of is it doesn't go down to the substrate. If it does that indicates that we do have an issue with cure and the simple solution to that is to rebake the part. Using this bottle of MEK, we will dip our Q-tip into the solvent and then holding the panel, we will do a back and forth motion. You want to be careful not to press too hard using the MEK. It could also, it could give you a false positive. I also want to mention that there are certain products that don't have good solvent resistance to begin with. So in this case, so this product should do well in this application. And I'm starting the test right now. Now, as you'll see, there is just a slight rub off. We didn't break through the film going back down to the substrate. So there's also a little recovery time where we'll also wait a few seconds before we'll check it again and just make sure that the film comes back to where it normally is as far as not breaking through the finish.
and using my fingernail, I will check this and it's not going back down to the base metal. So we know that we have a positive result on the application of this signal red. When doing an MEK test on a coated substrate, you have to remember that powder coatings are the powder coatings produced at IFS are thermal sets. That means that these parts have got to get up to a particular temperature, hold at that particular temperature, and to fully cure. In the case of the signal red, this is what we call a low cure product. So it cures at 340 degrees, which is peak metal temperature. Or in other words, the part has got to get up to that temperature and be held there for 10 minutes to fully cure or cross-link. So if you do have a problem with this, you can always put it back into the oven and then either slow the line speed down or increase the oven temperature or maybe a combination of both. Another thing too that I wanted to point out too is the thickness of the substrate that's being used. The thicker the metal, the longer it's going to take to come up to temperature. The thinner, obviously, the less time. So always keep that in mind when you are doing different products using the thermal set products because it may require, if you have a very heavy gauge product, a little bit longer to get that up to temperature. Uh, on that same line though, if you, your product fails on a solvent test, the one thing you can do is to put it back in the oven and cure it for a longer time uh, and then retest and see if that gets better. Uh, so if you ever fail, uh, I would put it back in the oven, cure it for a longer amount of time, make sure you get the proper temperature, make sure you don't have a heavy area in the part uh, and, and see if you get better performance on the solvent test the second time around. So once we've decided that we have good cure, another test that we, we do is uh, pencil hardness. Uh, there are, there is equipment, you know, ASTM equipment to do this test with. There are certain types of pencils that are supposed to be used to do this test. You know, we talk about 1H, 2H, 3H, 4H hardness pencils. Uh, for powder coating, a common number is 2H. We don't see a lot of powder coats harder than 2H. There are some out there and we can make some harder. But the common number is 1H or 2H. Uh, so basically how this test is, is done is you, you sharpen a pencil, flatten the tip, and then it is, it is pointed to the surface at a specific angle and is pushed across the surface with a, with a set amount of pressure from the device. If that pencil cuts down into the coating to substrate, we would say that is a fail. If it slightly indents the coating, I would not suggest that that is a fail. It, it's always been my opinion that if you go to the substrate, it's a fail. Uh, anything else is probably not. So if I if I needed to pass a 2H, I would test with a 2H. If it did not pass a 2H, then I would test with a 1H and see if we passed at that point. Again, we might need to cure the product longer to get a harder, a harder coating. Today, we're going to go over pencil hardness testing. Hopefully, you've already done a solvent test so we know that we have a good cure. In the pencil hardness testing, basically, we take a known hardness or softness of a pencil to see if it gouges down through the substrate or through the coating to the substrate. These things can go from B, which is soft, to H, which is hard or harder, depending on the type of uh, pencil that you have. Numerical denominations also can give you a hardness or softness of the pencil being used. In this case, a 2H or a 6H, where the 6H is harder than the 2H. Now there is an ASTM standard which is D3363 and which basically goes back to finding the, a known hardness of a coated surface. Now there are some that have a 
fixed angle like this particular unit that we have right here or in some cases it can be done by hand. With that we're going to show you how to do the test. Now this particular product that we have is our REL 9003 Crystal White and it has a on the technical data sheet it shows that it has a H to 2H range. We're going to use this device to do the testing and this allows us to give us a known weight with the pencil. We'll insert the pencil into the machine and then we will level it out and basically what we will do is we will push this along the surface and then see if we have any gouges in the substrate when we do the test. And according to this, we do not have any gouges down to the substrate, so we could consider this as a pass. In the last shot, we used the mechanical device. A lot of people will not have this particular unit and can also, with the pencils, do it by hand. And basically what you will do is you will place the pencil and just using average pressure push down and then go with a straight line now based on that we did not get any gouges into the substrate so this would be considered at least an H pencil hardness for this application having good pencils from a supplier such as either BYK or there's also a brand turquoise you want to be consistent with these pencils and make sure that you are have a high quality uh, supplier because it can inf affect the way you do this test uh, as I said BYK is one of the suppliers there are several others too but just be consistent with the pencils that you get Another thing too, when you're looking at our tech data sheet, you know, obviously it says what the range is. Now, if it does in fact fail, what you may want to do is go back and look at your time and temperature. As I said, on this particular product, it's a low cure. It's a 10 at 340 degree cure. If it fails and you have maybe a little bit thicker part, you want to make, go back, get it back into the oven, give it a little bit longer to fully cure. In some cases, you can over bake these products. If that be the case, you may have to redo the coating application. If you do run into a situation with over bake, you may have to go back and recoat the part. Because when you overbake it, you may run into a situation of degrading the resin system that is being used. So remember that if it's because of an overbake. Another thing too is you don't want to coat directly back over that overbake substrate because you can run into a situation of intercoat adhesion. And remember, if you do recoat the substrate, you do want to come back and redo the pencil hardness test to confirm that you do have or you do fall within the recommendations of the technical data sheet. Next, let's talk about cross hatch adhesion. And again, cross hatch adhesion is measuring a couple of things actually. Uh, it's, a, it's a measuring that adhesion of the coating to the substrate. But it also is a good uh, a measure of uh, cure as well. An undercure part will usually not pass a cross hatch adhesion test or not pass it uh, with a good rating. So just like all other equipment, uh, you know, there is an ASTM standard for cross hatch adhesion. That standard is based on a couple of things, usually film build related. Uh, you use a certain kit for uh, a low film build and a different kit for a higher film build. Uh, those kits are available, you know, from many different suppliers. Some of them are, you know, 
fairly cheap, 30, 40, 50 dollars. Uh, again, like anything else, there are, you know, kits with, with, with much higher uh, pricing, but there'll be a, a specific type blade in there. There'll be a tool to help you make the cuts and there should be a certified tape along with that uh, for you to use to see if you if uh, any coating comes off. So the basic test is it's called crosshatch because you use the device to cut left to right, then cut top to bottom across those lines you've already made. You do need to cut all the way to substrate, so you need to cut down through the coating. Uh, after you've done that, you brush it clean, remove any uh, any powder that's you know peeled up from the from the blades. Uh, get the the proper tape, place the tape on there, rub it down, make sure it is uh, is adhered very well, and then remove that tape. A coating that passes an adhesion test with a with the best rating there would be a 5B. When you pull that tape, you will not see any of the corners where those cross hatches are. You will not see any of those corners missing any coating. There's a rating system. If you look at those corners with a magnifying glass and three of them are starting to peel up or, or are missing the corners or something like that, there's a different rating for that. But the, what you want to see is absolutely no loss of adhesion on any of those little cross cuts you know, anywhere in that field. And that's what we would call a 5B, a 5B rating. So a uh, very good test. If for some reason you fail this test, what does it tell you? It tells you two things basically. Either one, my substrate is not clean properly or has some debris or something wrong with it that my powder will not adhere to the substrate. The other option is I did not get my powder cured and it is not because it is not cured. It is not performing and adhering the way it should to the substrate. So that's really the two the two things to find out of that test. Uh, there could be a, a time where, uh, you know, uh, certain types of products don't adhere as well as others, uh, like to a galvanized substrate. Uh, so you you might have to engineer around something, but it's normally either substrate's not proper or cure is not proper if you fail this test. With that said, uh, we got another video here uh, of Dave showing you know how to do a cross hatch adhesion test. So let's watch that video real quick. Today we're going to do a cross hatch adhesion test. Now, typically what you'll find in the crosshatch adhesion comes in a kit. In this case, we have the tape, the crosshatch device. We also have a small brush. And in some cases, too, you can also have a magnifying glass so you can check. With that, you will actually take this crosshatch device and going down to the substrate, you'll make like a crosshatch or a, I would say a tic-tac-toe scribe across the surface of this. You'll brush off any of the residue. And we're using a little bit thinner tape today, which normally it is a little wider but because of expediency, we'll use this particular one. We will apply the tape over the substrate and we'll rub that on. Remove as many air, if not all air bubbles as possible. Now, one of the things that I wanted to point out that we are using the gloss black, which is a very high gloss, uh, high DOI type finish and uh, very good looking product. And we want to make sure, like I said, that we get a good result. Otherwise, we may have to uh, go back and see where our problems are. 
But in this case, we'll go ahead and rip the tape off, and then we look at the back of it to make sure that we don't see any of these cross hatches coming off. Now, we can also go back and look at the rating card, which is a uh, ASTM. On the cross hatch adhesion test, there is a rating, and it goes from 5B on down, with 5B being the best. So when this test is performed, you can go back to this rating card and find out just where it falls. If we do have issues with a failure, one of the things we have to go back and look at, one is cure, the other is also pretreatment. So these are some of the things, too, we want to keep in mind when performing this test. And in this particular case, we did have a 5B test, which is passing. Again, thank you, Dave, for, for your assistance in this uh, webinar. So next, uh, let's just talk about visual checks. Uh, many times visual checks are, are simple and easy. Uh, some, sometimes people don't understand uh, what, what the stipulations are for visual uh, tests, but uh, you know, in the appliance industry, a lot of times we we will visibly look at a part and you know the common the common one of the acceptable things is if you hold the part three feet out in front of you basically an arm's length and do not see that defect then then it's okay you know the part is okay to ship but if i do hold it out there and i can see the defect then we would call it a reject so that said you need to know up front what your customer expects what they will allow and what they won't allow and when you can you need to test in the same matter that what the customer is going to test in and a lot of that has to do with how the part is placed is it low high up uh, up easily in your face like let's say the back guard on a stove that's something that you're going to see very easily you need to make sure you're looking at a part in that manner Whereas the, the kick plate on a stove that's mounted on the floor is not going to be easily seen. Another thing we talk about a lot of times is the lighting. Uh, there are several different types of lighting out there. Uh, many colors will look completely different under one light than they will under another light. So make sure you have the proper lighting that your customer expects. So if you're visibly looking at it against a, a, a color standard or a gloss standard or something like that, that you get the same visual effect that the customer is getting. Many, many times we have customers that have different lighting and it looks good in our shop or it looks good outside. It does not look good uh, under under other lighting. So So make sure you know that. Uh, visual color, you know, some customers have tight specs where you can't necessarily, you know, uh, just do it by visual, but many customers don't require a, a, a spec where you have to measure color. They will, they will, they're okay with a side by side color comparison. Gloss checks, uh, there are companies with, with ranges that are very significant and very tight. There are also ranges that as long as it visibly looks the same as the standard, you know, th they are fine with that. So, you know, we've talked about uh, film, build, film builds. You know, there there's equipment out there that measures color. There's equipment out there that measures gloss. You know, those types of products are usually quite a bit more expensive and not something you're going to see in a small shop. It's uh, something you're going to see in a, in, a, in a larger company. Uh, you know, another conversation to have here is, uh, is to talk about metallics a little bit. Visually looking at metallics can be, uh, can be a, a wide range, a wide variety based on lighting, based on film build, based on if you're comparing a powder coat to a liquid coat. So there's a lot of visual differences when looking at metallics based on, uh, based on your surroundings. All right, another one that we do on a regular basis, and we see this a little more with the uh, with the architectural coatings, uh, which is where this test really is, 
is the boiling water test. And really, the boiling water test is a is an adhesion test, and it's performed much like the the cross hatch adhesion test. So you you uh, we are testing for adhesion, and we're, we're testing it under a little little uh, more severe circumstance. So you would actually make your your cross hatch on your part, just like we talked about earlier. You would get a pot of boiling water, submerge that part in boiling water, depending on the spec. I think normally it's 20 minutes or 30 minutes. There's a couple of different specs out there. Once that part comes out, then you would dry it, clean it, tape it, and see if you have any edge pull on that coating as well. So uh, I've seen many times we can pass a regular adhesion test, but we cannot pass a boiling water test. So it's really checking the adhesion of the coating to a substrate under much more difficult circumstances than just a normal, uh, you know, something for my, my stove is not near as important as something I'm putting on a building that has to last 20 or 30 years. So it's a it's a little more harsh test for for adhesion purposes than what we have already talked about. So that covers, uh, you know, some of the general testing that uh, that we see out there. Obviously, there's specific testing that that you'll run a run across, uh, but you know. Just like we talked about in the previous webinars, you can check out uh, other videos that we have done in uh, at ifscoatings.com in our resource section. Uh, it, it we have videos that talk about outgassing, uh, dealing with craters and fish eyes, how to deal with picture framing and and uh, orange peel and all kinds of technical tips. So we have many things available on the website. Uh, just feel free to get on there. Review our ebook uh, and several of our guides that we've put together. And uh, as always, if you ever have uh, questions, uh, send your send your questions in to uh, codingsinfo at ifscodings.com. Those questions will get answered by myself or Dave or or somebody in the in the in the lab, and uh, we'll be happy to hear from you and uh, answer anything we can.